Well, this evening I get a break from three teenagers. <laughs> a bonus. I'd like to invite you to pay attention. Uh, and that seems a little strange, albeit normal, I guess, in a way. Um, so what happens when you hear the sound of the bells? What happened to your attention when you heard the bell? Just, just kind of share what your experience was. Focus. 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 Turned inward. Okay. The end of the yoga class. The end of the yoga class. You're ready to be in Shavasana. Right, <laughs> right before you fall asleep or something. Or right after you fell asleep. So that was mindfulness. It's really that simple. I like to use the definition, you know, we, when you're working in, acad in academia in particular, every time you have a discussion, a talk, you have to start with your definitions, and uh, sometimes they can be deadly dull. But I think it's important to think about and to hold with you as we kind of go through today. The definition that I like to use for mindfulness is moment-to-moment non-judgmental awareness. Okay, and I want to unpack that for you just a little bit. Um, because mindfulness is like the latest hot topic. Um, it's only, you know, 2,500 years old in, in concept and as old as humanity in practice. But it's a hot topic right now. So it's a 2,500-year-old hot topic. Yes? Would you be so kind to repeat what you just said about moment-to-moment? Moment-to-moment, non-judgmental awareness. I was about to apologize for not using PowerPoint for you tonight, um, but I actually much prefer not using it, even though it does make it easier for people taking notes. Um, just because uh, the farther we get away from reality, from the actual experience of it, the, the more it gets diluted to some degree. So that's why I tend not to, unless it's sort of an academic sort of talk or something like that. But so moment to moment, so the cliche would be that we only have moments to live, right? Um, but it's actually true, right? It's sort of a cliche because it's true. That every moment, in every moment, is the only place that anything can actually happen, is this moment. Now, right? and uh, as John Kabat-Zinn said the other night, who's kind of a a leader in our field, who is the leader in our field in many ways. He says, you know, check your, check your watch at any particular moment and you'll find, by golly, it's now. Right? And look at that, it's now again. This is it. But we have these amazing human brains that can do wonderful things. They can travel off into the future. They can sort of go back into the past. They can construct all sorts of scenarios and stories and rationales and interesting stuff. But it's not here. And in a way, it's not real, in the sense that what's real is what's here. So we can be sitting here, you know, and I can, I can ask you a silly question like, you know, raise your hand if you're present. Mm -hmm. You think how strange that is, but how present are you, really, moment to moment? Quite frequently, we're not. And that's, a, that's actually a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because if you were always in the present, you would be like my dog. You know, or your dog or cat, which is actually pretty cool. But um, on the one hand, to chase balls all day and people bring you food and you don't have to balance your checkbook and no looming income taxes or anything. But um, it's, it's pretty good to be human, I'd say. You know, we can think these big thoughts, we can plan things, we can organize things, we can recall things, we can put things together, we can anticipate the consequences of our actions. And that's awesome. But we can also create suffering for ourselves if we're not actually present. If you're sitting here and you're preoccupied with something that happened right before you came, you're struggling. You're creating a certain degree of suffering. Now, it's not maybe suffering on the grand scale of, you know, of, that we know can happen in the world, but it is suffering. 
Or if you're here and you're worried about the thing that's happen happening later, you're suffering. And while you're busy thinking about something that isn't actually here, you're not here. And you're missing out. So we kind of get that when it comes to good stuff, you know, stop and smell the roses. You know, we want to be present for those amazing moments, you know, at births and, you know, weddings and, you know, moments of meeting our true love and all of those kinds of wonderful things. We have a little tougher time when we start to talk about, well, what would it be like to be present to everything, including the things that are difficult? There's actually some, there's some possibilities in that that we can talk about. So when we can be fully present, we can actually appreciate what's here as it is, and we can let go a little bit about what's in the future and what's in the past. And, and there are a lot of benefits to that. So that's the moment-to-moment -moment piece. This is the only place we can do anything. This is the only place we can actually plan or remember is in this moment. And this is the moment in which everything happens. So that sounds really good. How you put that in practice is a whole other ballgame. But we'll start there. So moment-to-moment, non-judgmental. So that's a tricky one, and it's important to kind of talk about this a little bit because sometimes people will hear that and think that I'm supposed to not have judgment about anything, you know, that I'm supposed to be okay with everything, sort of a passive, sort of let everything go, let it all hang out, whatever sort of approach, but I really don't mean it in that way. So when I say non-judgmental, it's, it's something about sort of not being harshly judgmental about this moment or ourselves, and noticing when being judgmental isn't that helpful. So it is helpful to know, do I take this exit or not? You know, do I like chicken or fish? You know, um, is this something I want to tolerate or is this something I want to do something about? That's judgment, but that's judgment that serves us. But if we're beating ourselves up for not having done well enough, if we're judging an experience that's in this moment here. So if you're sitting here, for example, and you're thinking, well, I really could have been doing something else tonight, and this guy is blathering on about this boring topic or whatever. To whatever degree you're sitting there, stewing in that, and still sitting there, you're creating some suffering for yourself out of your own judgment that this is bad and this, you, it would be better for you to be somewhere else. So you can relieve your suffering if you'd like. You know, there's the door, that's okay. You know, but if you're gonna be here, what if you just, decide to be here. So that's a silly you know, situation, but how about a case in which you have chronic pain? And the pain is not going anywhere. And so you judge this pain as this terrible, awful thing that is ruining your life and causing all of these problems, and you hate it, and it's the cause of everything bad in your life, okay? So it doesn't, I'm not suggesting that like chronic pain is a good thing, but it's just a thing. It is an experience in this moment, and to whatever extent you can cultivate a different relationship with it, if you've got it anyway, it's sort of like what I say, like you, um, think about the relationship you have with gravity. There's a question you probably never heard before, right? What sort of relationship do you have with it? You, you just sort of live with it, right? You know, even though it exerts a certain negative force in your life, you know, if the the vase on the counter falls because of gravity, you know, it breaks, you know. Lots of other things where gravity plays a kind of negative role that you take a look in the mirror and things aren't where they used to be, that's gravity, and you don't really care for that very much, right? But you don't wake up in the morning and say, ah, damn, I'm still stuck to the earth. <laughs> you don't struggle over it. You accept the presence of it. You may or may not like it necessarily, but you work with it. You've cultivated a kind of relationship with it. You know it's not going anywhere. And so you said, well, given the fact that gravity is here, I'm going to have to work with it. Okay? So what if you could do that with some of the things that you can't change in the moment? Think about that for a second. You know, even if it's boredom with, you know, what it is that I'm saying, could you actually just stop and be here fully, let go of struggling to try to be somewhere else, and see if you can cultivate a different relationship with, you know, me? And what I have to say. It's not to say you have to like it or pretend that it's a good thing, but what if you could just shift with it? I worked with somebody with a lot of chronic pain for a long time. I worked in our pain clinic at UCSD. And um, he said, you know, I'm a tough guy. He said, you know, I grew up in Detroit, you know, kind of, you know, a little bit on the streets, and I had to kind of fight my way around. And 
I wrestled for a while and I fought my way to the top of my weight class and then I went to play football and my football coach taught me how to play hurt and to fight my way to the varsity and to make all state and to, you know, I, I played with broken bones and, you know, bleeding and all this sort of stuff and then I went off and, and started my career and I fought my way to the top of my field and I was successful and I fought all the way and then I had this accident and I have all this chronic pain and for 15 years I've been fighting with it. And he said, what I learned in the practice of mindfulness was that it was possible for me to dance with it. So can you feel that, that, that difference? He still has it. He's not blissing out and trying to pretend he doesn't have it. He's got it. But he's realizing that he actually has a choice in terms of how he's going to relate to it. A great example, another example, I worked in the cancer center for a long time. And if you think about you, you actually know about this cultivating a different relationship with things. You just don't always, we all rarely apply it in our own lives. So if you took a group of 10 women with breast cancer, so I, I sometimes preface this by saying breast cancer is not stressful. And I don't mean anything disrespectful about that. I just mean that there is no stress in the cancer itself. And if you take those 10 women, they all have the same stage, type of cancer, whatever, and you talk to them, you already know that those 10 women are going to be dealing with it in 10 different ways, right? One person's going to be, you know, kind of angry, another person's going to be depressed, one will be anxious, one will be withdrawn, one seems to be doing okay, one you can't really tell, whatever it is. So what did you just do? You just did a little scientific experiment where you controlled for cancer. All 10 of them had cancer, but they were dealing with it in 10 different ways. Where did that come from? Well, it came from their relationship with the cancer, right? I mean, if you think about it, if one person's kind of at peace with the fact that it's here, that's going to manifest in one way. If someone is in complete denial and is just not going to accept it, they're going to, it's going to manifest in a different way. And you get to control over that peace. So you might even be able to apply that to something like bipolar disorder. What is your relationship with it? And that may be if it's within you and you're the one who has that label, or even if it's a loved one, sort of what is your relationship with it? More than likely, because it's a challenging thing to say the least, you have a conflicted relationship with it much of the time, or some of the time. And maybe you've come to terms with it in some way, and probably that gives rise to a certain ease. And ease is pretty good. Huh? And sometimes, and you know what else is it never stays, right? You know, even if you sort of feel like you've come to terms, you know, usually people say, use the word acceptance, you know, well, you just need to accept it. So usually when people say you just need to accept something, it means that they've never actually experienced it, and they just think in their heads how you're supposed to deal with it, right? You know? Uh, I actually like acceptance, but I know that it's a charged word because it sounds like surrender, right? Well, what if you just look at it, because that's not really what it means. Acceptance the way I look at it in the practice of mindfulness is just accepting that what's here is here. It's not accepting that it's a good thing, it's not accepting it's going to be here forever necessarily, it's not accepting anything about it except that it's here, it's acknowledging. So sometimes I like to actually use the word allowing. So could you just allow what's here to be here? And you can feel the difference in that. You can feel the difference, it's like, I really like images that kind of evoke bodily sensations. So if you think about like going to, you know, arts and crafts store and buying a big piece of foam core or cardboard for a project and walking out into the parking lot in the wind, you know, on a windy day and you're walking like right into the wind, you know, you know what that feels like? It's like you're a human sailboat, right? Well, if you're trying to get that cardboard out to your car and the wind is blowing, you can just go headlong and fight your, you know, force your way to the car. or Turn 90 degrees, right? And then you, it's you, the cardboard, the wind, your car, except that the, the path is a little easier. And, and then a lot of times it's that kind of a shift, that dancing with it rather than fighting with it, that allows for that different relationship. And that's really what we're talking about here, that when we're aware, when we're in the moment, when we let go of judgment, we can actually cultivate a different relationship with difficult things. So it's going to take forever, given that I'm not even through with my definition yet. But moment to moment, non-judgmental. Because the other thing about judgment is that we're often very hard on ourselves. Is that, is that true of you, perhaps? Do you notice yourself being hard on yourself? 
Yeah, I always like to think, well, who is it that's being hard on me? How does that work? But that's a whole philosophical question. But the point is, you know, when things don't go right, if we don't like what we're feeling, we give ourselves a hard time for feeling it. It's like getting mad at the weather. Right? What if you could allow a feeling to be here just because it's here? Because if actually what we find is that with feelings, and you may find this too, have you ever been in a situation where you giggled at some inappropriate point in a conversation or a setting, you know, you're at a funeral or, you know, some odd, awkward moment and you something makes you fun, you know, laugh a little bit and then you try to make yourself stop and then it gets worse, right? You know, the more you try not to laugh, the more you do. You know, it's like, you know, don't think about a pink elephant, right? You know, as soon as you tell yourself not to, you do. So, what we resist persists. Think about that. What we resist persists. Especially in here. You, know? you almost can't, I mean, you can't make yourself not think about something. Right? So when you try to resist a feeling, if you feel sad and you're sort of trying not to feel sad, it actually kind of magnifies it. It persists, it stays with you. If you beat yourself up for something, <coughs> It tends to kind of, you know, um, foster it. If you're mean to yourself, if you if you're like judgmental of yourself, it fosters more judgmentalness because then when you give yourself a hard time, like I can't believe I thought that thought, which is a ridiculous thing to kind of say, but we do say that sometimes. And then you get your, you get down on yourself for having had the thought, and then you get down on yourself for having the thought about having having the thought, and then it just kind of goes like that. So we're shifting that relationship to, so the moment-to-moment non-judgmental awareness. So awareness is the foundation upon all, which all of this rests. You can't tell whether or not you're in the moment unless you're paying attention. Right? And you can't notice judgment when it's not serving you unless you're paying attention. If you bump into the mannequin in the, in the um, department store and say, excuse me, you're not really present, you're not really aware, right? so you're on autopilot. Right? They don't have mannequins, they don't see them as much anymore. So it all sounds good, right? I mean, I think in general it sounds like a good idea, like if I was more in the moment, if I was less judgmental and I was more aware, it might be a useful thing. That has very practical implications. And it can actually be cultivated. That's the really good news. So. Um, The thing about awareness is it's not continuous. Like, guaranteed, in the time I've been speaking, there isn't a single one of us that's been here in the room the whole time. Right? Your mind wanders off in random thought. You, know, you kind of start thinking, about, hey, he looks a little bit like my cousin. Oh, my cousin, I've got to give him a call. And he makes the best, you know, front ribs. And, well, I'm hungry, I wish I'd gone to dinner first, and you know, it just does that, right? It's what your mind does. And, and then you bring it back, and then it wanders off again. It's kind of like a wayward puppy, or like my dog again. My dog is on my mind today, so. Um, what is possible, though, well, first of all, that's, what that's called is mind wandering. And neuroscientists call it uh, the default mode network. So there are certain areas of the brain that kind of just kick in when we're not really thinking about anything, and much of the time we're not. Uh, and these certain areas of the brain, they're kind of just, they kind of rattle around, they kind of think a lot about ourselves. It's, a, it's, it's sometimes called self-referential thinking. It's like about, oh yeah, I'm bored, I'm uncomfortable, I want to do this, I'm this, I'm that. It's familiar, right? You know, we think a lot about ourselves. You know, it's the story of me and we like to play it on a regular basis. That's the default mode. And it's kind of not productive, and it's very familiar, and when we sit and meditate, we notice it happening all the time. And then there's a kind of a mindful mode where we're actually attending and we're present, that moment-to-moment non-judgmental awareness. And we move back and forth between those modes, and it's perfectly natural to have a mind that wanders. If your mind isn't wandering, you're probably dead. <laughs> Right. Okay, so in which case the whole mindfulness thing is not all that helpful to you anymore. So, um, but it happens and you can work with it. And the way I like to think about working with it, it's actually kind of possible 
to shift your relationship with that wandering mind and actually be more present more often. And it isn't just helpful so you don't miss your exit on the freeway or anything like that. There's some big ways in which it's helpful. And I think there's some very specific ways that are helpful in regard to something like bipolar disorder and moods in general. So I like to think of it a little bit as, again, back to my dog. He's a 115-pound golden retriever, so he kind of commands a certain amount of attention. Um, and uh, if you take the dog for a walk, and the dog wants to go where he wants to go, especially when he's 115 pounds, you go there. Right? You know? and he's there, and he's there, and he's sniffing, and he's that, and you know, you're kind of, kind of jerked around. Well, with a regular leash, that's the case, right? And we get jerked around by our minds all the time, right? You know, that whole mind-wandering thing. We just get taken wherever. So, uh, and again, we, if our mind didn't wander, we might be dead. If my dog didn't wander, same thing, or at least that he'd be asleep. But the alternative is that you can actually have one of those, you know the retractable leashes? You've seen those? You know, where they kind of go out and they can kind of come back, kind of got a spring-loaded kind of thing. This is, so this is helpful when you're walking the dog because the dog can do what it does and you can continue to walk the path that you intended to walk. Well, you can have that same kind of relationship with your brain. You can cultivate this ability for your brain to kind of go off and do what it does and come back. And you can continue in the path you intended so that you could be meditating, notice your mind wandered off, because it does, and continue to practice and say, oh, look at there, mind wandered off. And when you notice your mind wandered off, it's actually back. And then you go a little further, another like half a second, and it wanders off again, and then it comes back. And you can actually, what usually happens for people when they try to meditate is that they get jerked around by their mind and they think they're, or that they watch their mind wander off and they think they're not doing it right because the, you know, the mind should be like a well-trained dog. It doesn't work that way. But we can cultivate this relationship where we can continue to do what we need to do and allow it to do what it does. And actually over time, it wanders less or we notice it sooner. And the noticing it sooner is where I think this is really relevant, especially in terms of dealing with moods, and especially in terms of dealing with things like bipolar disorder. So I was thinking about this before I started, and I thought, how does mindfulness relate specifically? I know I have a couple of colleagues uh, in the work of teaching mindfulness who actually have bipolar disorder and have found that their practice of mindfulness keeps them well prevents relapse. And there are people doing a little bit of research on this, and I think there's plenty of room for more of it. And the way they've described it to me, I've kind of translated it into being, um, this may sound strange, but um, like a video game. And here's what I mean by that. So I'm not very good at video games. I have a 16-year-old son, he's great at all that stuff. I've tried to kind of do these sort of uh, car racing type of games where, you know, you're like on some sort of race track and you have to steer your car and you're, you know, you're racing against the other person. I'm terrible at it. And what happens is I'm constantly veering back and forth across the road. You know, like I don't have the subtleties and I don't play it enough and I don't have a, you know, I don't really have a motivation to really kind of want to get good at it. So I tend to kind of like just crash into things or that like I'm constantly bouncing off of this wall and that wall and back and forth. And, but my son, who's been doing it a little bit, can kind of pick up on the little nuances and can kind of navigate and kind of keep himself, you know, on the track. So, needless to say, I'm kind of equating that, that kind of bouncing back and forth to the, to the sort of bipolar disorder. And you hear a lot about, you know, how do you manage it, you know, aside from how you treat it with medication or whatever all else, like, how do you kind of stay in tune? And how do you notice the red flags when they're coming before it's too late? And all of that sort of thing. And it's all about in the subtleties of that. So what we're talking about is paying attention. And not just sort of like, yeah, you should pay attention. You know, you shouldn't overlook those, those signs and symptoms that, that mean the problem's coming. But, but really paying attention. Like moment by moment, getting to know the intricacies and in the working of your own mind. Now, that's tricky when you have a conflicted relationship with your own mind. If you're not happy with what your mind does when you're manic or depressed. But you can actually cultivate this sort of friendly, uh, playful curiosity to moment by moment of your life and to watch it 
and to watch what your mind does and maybe cultivate that relationship with it where it doesn't jerk you around. When you start to see it kind of tilt this way, and you can kind of move back this way. And then when you see it going this way, you move back a little bit this way. And you can contain a lot of reactivity when you're paying attention. Usually we don't want to pay attention. You know, we like to either pay, take a pill or have a procedure or you know, have someone remove whatever it is that's wrong with us and so we don't have to feel any of this stuff and we can just go down the middle of the road. But actually, we don't really like that sort of straight down the middle of the road thing either, right? No reactivity. You know, there's something about like, like I think of the mindfulness practice as a little bit like the shock absorbers in a car. Now, you don't really want a vehicle most of the time that you actually cannot feel the road at all, right? You don't want a car that has lousy shocks and bounces you all over the place, and you don't want a vehicle that has no shock absorber that every little bump you feel. You want a little bit of give, but you also want to be able to feel the road. And, you know, I know that a common complaint about, you know, medications that manage bipolar disorder is that you can't feel the ups and the downs. So we're talking about being able to feel the ups and the downs and actually tune into them and be there for your whole life. So this is possible, strange as it may seem, through the practice of mindfulness. So mindfulness, I men mentioned meditation, didn't really say anything more about that. So mindfulness is this quality of mind and it can be cultivated in a variety of ways. Most typically it's cultivated through the practice of meditation. There's nothing magic about meditation. As far as I know, no matter how much you practice it, you never levitate up off of the cushion. At least I haven't. Um, my favorite new little thing is a friend of mine gave me this uh, keychain thing. It's a little Buddha. Mindfulness has some Buddhist roots, uh, and uh, it has a little light in the bottom of it. And, I, did, I didn't know what that meant. I, th I thought maybe that when you became enlightened, that light comes out of your body. <laughs> I wrote a whole little thing about it because I thought, well, you know, if you're sitting on the cushion and you're thinking you're enlightened and you want to check, as soon as you check, you're not enlightened anymore. And it's, like, it's like the light in the refrigerator thing, you know. So you can cultivate it through the practice of, of meditation. You can cultivate it in the practice of yoga, which is really just a kind of movement that meditation would be another way of putting it. You can cultivate being present in a lot of different ways. There's nothing magic about meditation, but it is a kind of systematic formal activity that actually facilitates becoming more mindful. So I mentioned John Kabat-Zinn, who I uh, had the pleasure of having here for a conference that we hosted this past weekend, who really was the founder of all of this. He was a molecular biologist, um, PhD from MIT, so naturally he went on to teach meditation. Um, and he's a, he's a very bright guy and really kind of thought, you know what, this is a practice that's ancient. It's, tw it's intended to cultivate a, a different way of relating to difficulty such that it relieves suffering. It was all about the practice of mindfulness is, is a means to reducing um, suffering. He was working in a hospital, UMass Medical Center in Worcester, Massachusetts looked around and said, hey, this is a suffering magnet. There's suffering everywhere here. Why don't I bring this mindfulness practice that I have in my own life to these people who are suffering? And he did. He created a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. It's been taught for almost, almost 40 years now, around the country, around the world. It's taught in you know, hundreds of people teaching it. We teach it here at UCSD. Um, you got a flyer about our particular program. There's programs at Scripps and Sharp and in the community and all sorts of places. And it's an amazing program where we're systematically cultivating mindfulness to relieve suffering, to ease stress, pain, and illness. Stress is really just the struggle with how things are. And so if you can cultivate a different relationship with the things, you can have stress reduction. So I don't know if stress reduction is of interest to you. Anybody here have stress? <laughs> Anybody here not have stress? Again, if you don't have stress, you're probably dead. So, um, it happens. Stress happens. So, you cultivate this different relationship with it and all kinds of things happen. Your experience of pain changes. Physiologically, you still, you know, if you have chronic pain, you still have chronic pain when you're done with the MBSR program. But what's different is that you have a different relationship with it. You may be dancing with it instead of fighting with it. Anxiety, you know, anxiety is largely 
it's exclusively about the future, preoccupation with the future. We once wrote a, um, an abstract for a presentation, and we called it anticipatory anxiety, and then I realized there really isn't any other kind, mm -hmm. if you think about it. So maybe what you come out of with the practice of mindfulness is to live a little more in the present and a little less into the future, whether it's a few seconds or a few years or many years. Can you be actually more present? Maybe you're looking for some sort of sense of balance and control in your life. Now, good luck with the control thing because uh, I think it's largely an illusion of control, but maybe when we think we're in control and we're not, we're causing ourselves some suffering. You know, I once saw a little kid in the back seat of a car in a stop and go traffic, and he was in a car seat, and on the back of his mom's uh, driver's seat was like a simulated dashboard with like a steering wheel and a lever and buttons. And, and you know, I looked over and he was there, like his brow was furrowed, he was grabbing the wheel, and like, <laughs> pushing the levers, and doing this. Like, whoa, you could almost imagine like his white knuckles, you know, yeah. as if he had control. And, and I think, you know, we're often like that, right? We're like grabbing the wheel and, you know, clutching it like, like we actually have control when frequently we don't, right? Um, so maybe it would be okay to let go of it when we, when we don't really need it, when it's not really serving us. It's a little bit like the serenity prayer from AA. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. You know, this is wisdom. The wisdom to be able to discern <coughs> what is it that I can control and what do I have to let go of. And nobody's going to be able to tell you what to let go of. It's just like someone telling you to just accept it. But when you actually pay attention, you actually find where you can let go and where you, where you really shouldn't. And you get to make these sort of mindful choices. And different things happen. So there's a ton of research. If I was doing PowerPoint, I'd show you my slide that shows how many studies have looked at mindfulness and mindfulness-based stress reduction over the last 20 years. And it's this little graph that kind of creeps along like this and then just goes like through the roof. And um, NIH, National Institutes of Health, and National Institutes of Mental Health, and the uh, National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which is a part of NIH, are all funding studies around mindfulness and mindfulness-based stress reduction. Imagine that. Um, because there's something to this. And not only is there a lot of research being done, but there are a lot of re results being yielded. And not only just people reporting that their pain is better, that they're less anxious, that they're less depressed. Um, there's awesome evidence for something called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for relapse prevention and depression and people doing research on it now for relapse prevention and bipolar disorder. That actually shows that as a, not as a treatment for depression, but as a, as a treatment to prevent relapse. So once people are well, like what kind of tools can you give them to stay well? That, that this mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, MBCT, actually works quite well, especially for people with multiple episodes of depression in their past. Um, and even more impressively to me, more recently, they've actually been able to show that it's equally effective to antidepressant medication in helping to keep people from relapsing. And believe me, it has way fewer side effects. And it's cheaper in the end, <laughs> right? And you have all the equipment you need. There's no special equipment as long as you can breathe, you're set. Um, and it's a skill. It's a, you know, it's a skill or a way of being that stays with you, no matter, you know, pills, eventually you may want to stop taking them, you know. So there's some really powerful reasons for, what, for practicing something like this. You know, it's not as, um, our, ch our challenge in terms of getting things funded around mindfulness research is that there's no money to be made. You know, I'm not getting rich teaching meditation, believe me. Um, and there's no product, you know, there's no drug, there's no device, there's no all that sort of thing. So I'm not here to whine about that because I'm not a researcher. but. Um, it's important to kind of note that. So other effects of mindfulness include studies that have looked at literal changes in function of the brain, like areas of the brain, like the people have, uh, when you have sort of engaged in negative emotion, there's sort of right prefrontal areas of the brain that are engaged, involved in this process that actually through the course of taking an eight week MBSR course, the activity highest down in the right prefrontal and warms up in the left prefrontal, which is more around sort of positive emotions. Um, there is actually evidence of enhanced immune function. Again, pre to post, just an eight week class. It's a whole class of meditation. It's a class about nothing. It's like the Seinfeld of stress reduction. 
That's what it is. It's practicing being present, breathing, you know? Um, and it actually affects how your immune system deals with, an, with a challenge, like a flu uh, bug, basically. Um, change, structural changes, like areas of the brain in long-time meditators actually are thicker over time than non-meditators. Now this is like long-term meditators, monks and folks like that, but something is happening in there when you're just practicing meditation. And now there's some really kind of exciting stuff that I don't even completely understand around uh, something called telomerase, which is something about it. Telomeres. Telomeres, yeah. And, uh, they're lifelines. Yeah, and they're like the caps on the ends of the, of the genes that actually kind of, you know, normally our genes sort of wear down over time just to kind of oversimplify it. And it, not only is there actually a preservation of this, so like a preservation of, you know, a slowing of the aging process, there's actually some preliminary evidence that shows the possibility of actually reversing that process and sort of growing back. So, it's amazing stuff. And it's really simple. It's just sitting on a cushion, bringing your attention to the present moment again and again and again. And um, that's all there is to it. It's, sim it's simple. It's just not easy. Does anybody in here meditate on a regular basis? Yeah. Anybody think it's easy? It's just like the hardest work on the planet, is what John Kevin's in says. So, I mean, I, I didn't come here to sell our program. It sells itself. If you're interested in mindful space stress reduction, Google MBSR in San Diego. You'll find half a dozen places or more that teach it. Love to have you come and take it from us. But um, more importantly, it's just the idea of mindfulness and the practice of it and the potential benefits of it. So what questions do you have? How does uh, mindfulness differ from DBT? Dialectical behavioral yeah. therapy. Well, mindfulness is actually a component of dialectical behavior therapy. So that's a, a typically a, a kind of intensive treatment that uh, is often offered for, for people who have a lot of sort of difficulty m m regulating mood. And, um, and we're still talking about the same thing. So there are a lot of skills in DBT around, around how to contend with it, how to we use a really nice example in there that I sometimes share with people is that, you know, we're never, I was going to say we're never in our right mind, but what I mean is that we have times when we're in a sort of logical, rational space, you know, we're in the sort of accountant mind that we have about sort of everything has to kind of line up and be very logical and make sense. And then sometimes we're over on this other side where it's like emotional mind, right? When it's all about the emotions, you know, it's just like crazy you know, roller coaster of emotion. And there's nothing wrong with either of those, but you can't really, you don't really want to live in either of those all the time, right? Sometimes, you know, you know, it's great, like if you're an accountant, that when you go to work, you can stay in that rational mind and you don't really need a lot of that whole emotional stuff to get your job done. But when you go home to your wife, I'm thinking you might want to kind of come out of that just a little bit, just speaking from my own experience. And there's some great things about being an emotional, creative, you know, intuitive sort of person, but sometimes you gotta pay the bills, right? So those are both areas, and if you live too long in either of those, and a lot of us go back and forth between them pretty, you know, pretty dramatically. So the place where those two overlap is wise mind. Remember I mentioned wisdom before, the wisdom to know the difference. That space in between is that wise mind. And if we can practice being there, there's some benefits. We can still have both, sort of a middle way or a middle path. And so DBT really teaches a lot of skills to kind of help kind of steer you back and kind of see things more clearly. And at the foundation of it is mindfulness. Short practices we're not talking about. The kinds of things we teach in MBSR, we're talking about five or 10 minutes of being present. And sometimes, you know, there's a lot going on up here in five minutes of being present with this is, is about all one can manage. So that's kind of, it's just a, it's a component of, of DBT. Any other questions, thoughts? Anybody skeptical? Think this is just the latest fad? Well, it's not the latest fad. <laughs> there are a couple even newer than this, right? A couple of mine old. I remember uh, uh, ages ago, back in the 80s, I was doing some work at a college campus that was growing up in Fairfield, Iowa, that became the Monterey Region for Asheville University. Oh, okay. They had built on the campus two 
meditation domes, you know, one for women and one for men. And uh, in those domes, they were trying to uh, levitate. And that was their uh, their expression of mindfulness. And, but, you know, I, I took a, a little TMI, and, and that was pretty interesting for a while. And I, I was curious if any of your mindfulness training resembles some of those other schools of meditation, like mm. perhaps TMI. Yeah. Um. <coughs> Think of it as TM, and TMI is too much information. But for me, but you know, maybe it's oh, sorry. <laughs> That's just where my mind went for a second. I wasn't listening. So. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, when your psychologist like. Hey, it's hardly ever TMI because that's what we're doing. So, you know, but I, as I understand, I don't know a lot about TM, but the way I've understood it is that it's a little more about a kind of concentrative practice, a kind of a focusing of the mind. You know, there's a mantra I think, and and it's a it's about sort of that focus, which has a certain benefit to it in its own way. But then the, the mindfulness is sort of the flip side of that, is where it's sort of a wide open focus, where you're sort of holding everything in awareness. Both of them challenging in their own way. But the idea is kind of, the way I kind of look at it is that this practice of mindfulness allows you to sort of see everything as it is. It sort of restores perspective. And you hold it in a larger space where pretty much anything, you know, we usually get hyper-focused on things, you know. I have a tendency, like in the morning, early mornings in particular, to like start to think about something that's bugging me, you know, that I need to deal with. And suddenly it just swells up into being the biggest thing in the world. I lose perspective. And then, you know, you get out in the daylight and you kind of see everything in a bigger perspective, you can kind of manage it in a different way. And, and the other example I think of is that take a uh, teaspoonful of salt and you dissolve it in a cup full of water and you taste the water, you're going to taste the salt, right? You take the same teaspoonful of salt and you dissolve it in a 100 gallon barrel, probably not going to really notice the salt. Well, we can be like that container because life hands us the salt. You know, salt happens. <laughs> And it's going to happen. We're all going to get our teaspoonful of salt. But we, and we don't have any control over this, that kind of stuff. But what we do have control over is the size of the container in which we hold it. We can be that little cup or we can be that big barrel. And it's through the practice of things like mindfulness that we can hold it in that larger space of awareness. And so those things that are kind of, could be big bumps if they're in a little cup, become just kind of road noise in the bigger barrel. So, so I think that's the kind of the difference in general, and they sort of both have their place, but that's kind of the difference. Does someone have a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you use a mantra when you uh, practice this? Because a lot of times people want to encourage to do that in, in meditation practice. Yeah, and that's typically born in the, in the TM, or Transcendental Meditation, the concentrative practice where there's a mantra, because here we are, we're using the breath most often as a focus. Um, but that's kind of more like an anchor than anything else. It's not like it's sort of a hyper-focus on the breath. It's just sort of allowing the breath to be the place that you return to when your attention wanders. But it's really more about this sort of open awareness. And, you know, so we always, you know, we always see things from the point of view of our, like our team or our way of looking at things. So I, I have a tendency to feel like this open awareness is what allows a little bit more equanimity and kind of riding with the with the bumps, where the sort of focus on a mantra or a candle flame or an object of some sort. Yeah, I, I have a comment about because uh -huh. you're you're describing because I, I at sixteen I did a TM uh -huh. course and you know at sixteen your brain's all over the place and it was a chemistry German chemistry female professor who says I want you to do this for me I'm like sure well I think the mantra is useful TM it is you know is a little bit culty but. You know, the idea was to to get your mind from going all over the place and bringing it down into a, a, a focused zone. But with PM, your mind's wandering all the time. It does. It, it wanders when you when you do that. And so you just, at least when I was 16, I used it as a way to focus my mind from going off and thinking anxiety things. And that brought me down to a place where I then allowed my mind to wander without anxiety things. So I got into a more expansive awareness. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm not sure that was their goal. No, but I wanted to fly. Yeah. And so then I always <laughs> allowed, I'm working I, out so I, I, let, I actually let myself fly. So it, it, you could use TM mantra wise to pull you back when your brain's thinking, oh, I've got to go over to this and I forgot to call her. 
you know, you can use it, but then once you're in that spot of bringing it down, you go back into like just a presence of being. And so, but not everybody does that because you're focusing on, the, on the, your mantra. But the mantra just becomes like a breathing thing to bring you back to me. So if you're using it right, you're back into an expansiveness of awareness. Yeah, I think that will. I don't need to do that. I, I do it through some physical things, breathing and, um, and then comment about EMDR in <laughs> conjunction with mindfulness. Um, yeah, so I, I went through training in eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is a treatment often used for trauma. And um, it has its whole technology to it, but in, in its essence, it's largely, in my mind, a mindfulness practice in that you're holding, aware, holding things in awareness and staying with them and noticing your reactivity. A lot of what mindfulness, when we teach it in the MBSR course, we talk about differentiating between reacting and responding. So if you think about that for a second, so usually we react. You know, we have our autopilot, we, go, we have our go-to way of dealing with things, and that's reactive not reflective, and we're not paying really close attention, but the opportunity exists for us to meet difficulty and choose a response rather than finding ourselves in a reaction. And so this practice in, in EMDR is really sort of holding a person present, letting them be aware that they are actually present even when they're recalling these difficult memories. And so they can hold them and, and sort of reframe them essentially as memories rather than sort of realities. Um, you had a question. Um, with TM, I mean, I have tried to meditate. The thing that is different with mindfulness is it actually lays out you're gonna, your mind is gonna go back and there's no wrong way of meditating. They never said that when I was like younger. I just felt like, oh, I failed because I didn't hold this mantra, you know? And, and so the real difference is that awareness, the awareness that our minds are what they are, they're going to wander, and it's okay, you're still meditating. Yeah, yeah you, you even corrected yourself when you, you know, on purpose, you know, you said, I used to try to meditate. Right. I like to tease people in the classes when they say they tried to meditate. I said, I, so that's my one chance I get to quote Yoda, you know, where he said, do or do not, there is no try. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're intending to sit down and meditate, you're doing it. It's already it. There is no you know, good, better, best. No one gets an A or gold stars. If you're intending to do it, you're doing it. So, I didn't have my hand up before, but I do That's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you're quick on the draw. So no. you know. um, could you say a little bit more? I'm having a hard time understanding or grasping the concept about pain and mindfulness. Oh, yeah. Is there research that shows that the pain is reduced? Well, let's put it, um, that's a whole topic in and of itself, but I can hit the high points, which is that we already know that if you, your experience of pain, if you look at the brain in an fMRI when you're experiencing pain, especially chronic pain, it's not just like there's some little spot that corresponds with your lower back that's lit up. That area is lit up, and then there are areas that are lit up around the emotion associated with that, and also the cognition and what you're thinking. And I kind of think of the differentiating between sensation and distress. So the, the area of the brain that lights up around that location in the body is sensation. The thinking and the emotion, like, oh gosh, is this ever going to go away? And I wonder what's wrong and blah, blah, blah. That's the distress piece. So it's this cloud that goes around it. And so when we say, you know, when you've been asked, you've probably been asked by your doctor before, because they always ask, you know, if you have pain, how bad's your pain on the one to 10 scale, you know? It's a lovely question. People love answering that question. Um, and it, you know, I make, I'm sarcastic largely because it's a hard question to answer because it's not a simple thing. You know, if it was literally just that sensation, you could say, oh yeah, it's about a four. But if you're pissed off because you're in pain, you know, or you're worried that you're in pain, then, then there's, there's this other cloud of distress. And so you could say you're an eight. It, you know, two people could come in with exactly the same sort of like physical manifestation. One could tell you it's a two, one could tell you it's an eight. The person with a two, sort of like for whatever reason they've cultivated this relationship with it where it doesn't really bother them, they've lived with it for a while and they kind of know it. So it's really just all sensation and not much distress. Someone else could have that same two of sensation but they've got a six of distress because it's like brand new or like, you know, whatever it is, they're all upset. So what I think the practice of mindfulness does, and people haven't really looked at this super closely, is that 
it, it doesn't do much with the, this, with the sensation. You know, maybe if there's some muscle tension involved and you, be, you become relaxed, maybe it helps a little bit with that, but it helps a lot with the distress. You know? Actually, like um, nitrous oxide, laughing gas, you know, if you've ever had that at the dentist's office, it's not an anesthetic. It doesn't literally block the pain. It just causes you not to care that you have it. <laughs> literally. I mean, you know, you say, oh, yeah, huh? yeah, there's pain. There's a lot of pain. Oh, my gosh, there's a lot of pain. You're just, like, sitting there. What is that? It's really taking this, the distress out of the picture so there's just the sensation. And that's why, I mean, you know, again, back to pets and dogs, you know, why they can tolerate a fair amount of pain because they're not freaking out about it. They're not thinking about all the other times when they had pain and they're not worried about whatever it might mean. It's just pain. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It's just that it doesn't have that overlay of the distress. I think you had a question back. Yeah, I was just wondering if there's a certain amount of time that you recommend for meditating and your classes. Yeah, 42 minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question because what we ask of people in the class is to practice 45 minutes a day every day. Um, and that's a lot, <laughs> if, if possible. And, you know, first of all, you know, it's a stress reduction class, and if, if you've already got 45 minutes, like, left over during the day <laughs> to meditate, and probably stress is not your biggest issue. <laughs> so it's a process of making it a part of your life. What happens is, you can do, and, you know, people say, well, you know, we should just ask people to do 20 minutes, because really most people won't really do 45 when you ask them to do that. And that's, you know, studies show that people don't practice 45 minutes a day in a typical MBSR class. The average is more like 20 or 25 minutes a day. And I actually think that if we started saying, well, why don't you just practice 20 or 25 minutes a day, they practice like 10 or 12 minutes. <laughs> it's sort of that, that difference. The thing is that, like, we, we give people practices, like, on a video, on a CD or on downloadable. We have a 20-minute practice and a 45-minute practice. And I always encourage people to do that for 45 minutes. 20 minutes, you can do almost anything for 20 minutes. You know, look, you can sit and listen to me for an hour, so, you know, think about that. So 20 minutes. So what happens in 20 minutes is, like I said, you can kind of tolerate anything and your mind's kind of all over the place and that maybe there's some, some degree of benefit. So on the, on the one side, five minutes is better than no minutes. If you just have the intention to stop and be present, you're doing yourself a favor already. If you want to really sort of yield the sort of, you know, the greater, I don't want to sort of make it sound like, you know, you go faster, better, longer. But there is some benefit to longer practice that something happens in, over a period of time that has come to be sort of accepted as 45 minutes, because that's what happens on meditation retreats and things, is that you get past that initial storminess of your mind being all over the place, and there's a certain amount of settledness that sort of emerges naturally. It doesn't mean it happens every time and you just reach some sort of nirvana state, but staying with it, not sort of like sitting and saying, oh my gosh, my mind's all over, I'll just do this another time, you know, but actually sticking with it and having that seems to be, in general, there's still a lot of work to be done to really parse that out and say for sure that that's the, you know, the best, but a longer period tends to kind of give that benefit. Did you have a question? To add to that, um, any time you're trying to do something that you're not comfortable TM for a long time, so I know the procedure. What's the procedure for practicing mindfulness? <laughs> bringing your attention to your breath, noticing when it's wandered off and bringing it back. I like to say it's a little bit like the shampoo bottle, it's just lather, rinse, repeat. You know? It's really no much more complicated than that in that sense that it's you know, using the breath as this kind of anchor to notice what's coming up. Paying attention when you notice you've wandered, coming back. 
you know, sometimes people turn it into a whole big thing and there's sort of imagery involved and things, but really at its heart, that's all there is to it. And that's what I that's what I love about it is the simplicity of it. It's even more simple than the TM in terms of it's just there. <laughs> you know? uh, again, I don't want it like that. It doesn't need to be a debate about one versus the other, but it's it's worth sort of experimenting and seeing what what arises out of one and the other. And to sort of notice the, the tricky part that I was kind of thinking about saying earlier is that there is sometimes a, a kind of a desire to get to a particular state of mind, even if it's just to be a little more relaxed, a little more at ease. The tricky part is that as soon as you start to try, you're sunk, <laughs> I think, in my, in my mind. Sometimes you can force about a certain amount of relaxation, but it, this practice is largely about not trying to get anywhere at all. It's actually trying to be largely where you are already. And so it, it's, a, it's a paradoxical thing. It's hard for us to kind of grasp sometimes. But if we notice that we're suffering, one possibility is to just meet that suffering in the moment because we're suffering. Right? You know, we have a whole we have another course we teach called mindful self compassion, which is kind of a new mm -hmm. thing that's being taught, and we're in one of the first places teaching the eight week version of it. And we say, you know, when you notice that you're suffering, when you notice you're being hard on yourself, you start right here meeting that suffering with kindness. Like this is a part of the human condition. <laughs> like you don't need to change it; you need to get rid of it. Is it uncomfortable? Absolutely. But it's also part of being human, and could you just meet it with kindness? So it's about sort of not trying to get anywhere at all, in a way. So, did you have a question? Um, something to, to sort of share <clears throat> between mind, mindfulness and meditation. I was taught not too long ago uh, a, um, a little exercise. started with just walking, called a mindful, uh, mindful or meditative walk. Right foot, left foot. All it is just paying attention to your right foot and your left foot as you walk around keeping just just that presence and then as you get more comfortable as an exercise making it your your movement as you pick up a glass as you pick up a pen as as you do anything in life being very very present that's your meditation being mm -hmm. very present of that moment of what exactly you're doing in that moment Amazing. It is. That's amazing. It is. And that's if you haven't ever tried it, it sounds ridiculous. On the one hand, I, I, you know, I mean, but you try it. Don't take anybody's word for it. Like I always say that too in my classes. Like, don't take my word for any of this. Put it into practice and see what happens, and see what 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 she's referring to as amazing, but out of out of your own experience. Well, so along the same line with mindful eating, how many times do you yeah. eat something? Wait a minute, I didn't even enjoy that. Mm -hmm. Pay attention, pay attention to the texture of the stage, all of that. And then driving, how many times do we get somewhere and wonder how the hell did I get there? Right. Mm -hmm. so exactly. I just want to kind of wrap up. We're out of time, and, and I wanted to mention the eating. You know, we have a mindful eating class too. But the um, the point of it is that not, there are a few things in our lives that are more sort of charged with emotion and reactivity than eating. You know, in terms of either we get excited about stuff or we eat to manage our moods. You know, I don't know if you might have that happen, but most of us have. You know, um, you know, we we often eat for reasons other than the to feed the body. But we're often not really that tuned into that, right? And you know, it's how we end up eating things that aren't good for us, how we end up gaining weight, how, you know, just all kinds of stuff. I don't know if there's any time to kind of go into it. But we also know that when people practice mindful eating, when people practice mindfulness, last thing, a colleague of mine um, who's done studies of um, prostate cancer and looking at the effects of a, of a whole foods plant-based diet and a kind of a practice of mindfulness and the effects on um, all of the processes involved in, can in uh, prostate cancer. I'm not going un to untangle those. Um, but what they found was they taught these, these, these men who had, been, uh, had had prostate cancer this diet, this very intensive diet, and they also taught them uh, mindfulness meditation, actually at UMass. And these people got better, and there's all kinds of good things. But what they noticed was that separate from the actual diet, people lost weight mm -hmm. for no reason that they could explain, except for the fact that they were practicing mindfulness. So they were making different choices. 
because they were probably less reactive and more responsive. <coughs> they're actually paying attention to what they're eating and noticing it, and noticing this, the cues about when they were full, and making the choices that were more wholesome or better for them or whatever. And that wasn't even an intention of the study. So um, that's where it has a great potential in terms of you know, our uh, obesity epidemic, especially with kids. You know, so that other topic. So, Thank you for attention. I can hang out a little bit if you have an individual question or whatever. And um, thanks for having me.